and maybe maybe you'll get better uh, gradients in valve areas. The vitamin stress echo is important for uh, LV systolic dysfunction. And there is a protocol of it. You start doing it with two to five mics per kg per minute with an increment of a infusion of three to five minutes to a maximum dose of 10 to 20, which is low dose. And then you should stop as soon as you get the positive return or heart rate begins to rise more than 10 to uh, 20 beats per minute over baseline or exceeds 100. The moment it exceeds more than 20 beats per minute, rest assured, you are not in low dose now. You are going into high dose because in low dose, it is only the inotropy which increases. That means the contractility increases. The moment it crosses 100 beats per minute or it crosses 20 beats per minute from the baseline, you are now going into high dose of the vitamin because not only is the inotropy increasing, here now the heart rate is increasing. That means it is increasing the chronotropy also. Uh, how do you define severe stenosis and vitamin stress echo? Aortic valve area less than one, jet velocity more than four, mean gradient more than 40. And lack of contractile reserve, failure of ejection fraction to increase by 20% is a poor prognostic sign, suggesting that these are the patients post-operatively they'll do poorly. Serial measurements are needed. So I am just finishing off here for some uh, uh, pictures and uh, I will share another screen of mine where So let me just complete the uh, pulmonary stenosis also and then we can have some discussion and show you some uh, cases. Is my screen visible, sir? Uh, not yet, Samir. Okay. Now it's better. It is seen now. So pulmonary stenosis, I'll finish off quickly. It's a typical, uh, typically in pulmonary stenosis, the valve annulus is almost always preserved. Again, systolic doming is the sine qua non of stenosis. Parasolic short axis plane through the base of the heart is the best view. And lower interspaces to better align with superiorly directed jets, subcostal, suprastonal approach, and in children, you can get subcostal velocities also. How do you start suspecting pulmonary stenosis? It's important because all of us, how do we start? We start with parasol long axis. And the most ignored thing is RV. The moment you start seeing RV is hypertrophy. Hunt for two things, pulmonary artery hypertension and pulmonary stenosis. In both these cases, you will find that the RV is thickened. There may be uh, post aortic dilatation uh, in, in uh, uh, pulmonary stenosis, which is not correlated with severity. With RVS, there may be variable degrees of subalveolar narrowing also. But in most cases, RV size and functions are normal and trabeculation of RV is increased. So it looks thicker. Degree of septal flattening and RV enlargement is proportional with severity of stenosis. This is how you typically see in a short axis. There is a calcification uh, and, and in adults, if you are seeing or suspecting pulmonary stenosis, if you are getting increased flows and if there is no calcification, please start looking at AST. There is no pulmonary stenosis in adults or at your and my level. There are all the levels. I mean, slides are stationary. They are not moving. Okay. Yeah, I think now they'll move. So if you are seeing an adult patient with increased velocity across pulmonary valve, now you are keen to make a diagnosis of pulmonary stenosis valvular. 
so when is it justified and when is it that you have to hunt for shunting or intracardiac shunt which is left to right shunt so my basic uh, premise on based entirely on statistics is that almost always pulmonary valve stenosis is associated with calcification if in an adult you don't see calcification and you see only the velocities which are increased i desperately start hunting for an ast which may be many a times only uh, not the fossa valve as it could be uh, you you usually don't miss um, the septum primum but sinus venosus asds are very easily missed and we have picked up enough and more only based on this intuitive finding that if you are getting increased flow across pulmonary valve it is not calcific hunt for asd and you lo and behold many a times you will find that you have um, missed on uh, sinus venosus asd now uh, most of the times this is uh, uh, mixometer uh, thickening and and uh, it's important to find out what the gradients are uh, this is just about it you can get different types of uh, stenosis you can get infundibular stenosis which is quite a uh, finding in in tetralogy of fellow uh, supravalvular membrane exactly like what is happening to the aortic valve you translate it to the right side and that is it this is these are different screens uh, which i am showing because uh, the pediatricians are very fond of inverting the images the since we do a lot of transesophageal echo we have started understanding otherwise during the initial phases of my learning it was quite a challenge uh, this is different kind of pictures as ps with pulmonary regurgitation but uh, for stenosis part of it this should suffice as uh, the, the 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 start point that look at the peak velocities and look at the peak gradients if your gradients are more than 64 mm of mercury you are dealing with pulmonary stenosis less than 36 it is mild and you can calculate actually you can calculate the pulmonary valve area also if your pulmonary valve area is less than 1 uh, cm square you are dealing with a severe uh, stenosis now i'll just go back to one more set of slides to just uh, show you the clinical importance of different views here is a pical window this is in a pical window what is the max pg 16 what is the mean pg 10 but since the aortic valve looked thickened and doming we were convinced that we are not looking at a mean pg of 10 more calcification more severe is the stenosis did a gls grossly reduced gls did a global longitudinal strain grossly reduced this is something where we were uh, convinced that we were dealing with something bad and we went into different modes of uh, i am just trying to yes this is the one which we did and we found that in right peristal so look at this you have to get this into the right mode so it's the letter two which which are crossing the uh, four meters per second mark but this is an average of 53 mm of mercury which was significant out externosis now if you look at this this is the apical and the right so if the jet is not aligned properly you will always get less some is slight not not moving please just settle them up wait a no they've seen it won't sir it won't hold them so can you see now yes sir we can see that 
Yes, okay. So left side is mean gradient 10, right side is mean PG 53, and both of them are from different windows. So please see five windows at least and record them. Now this is another refractory heart failure. A pical window showed gradient of 26, not correlating with her clinical presentation. So what did we do? We looked at subcostal and lo and behold, this is what we found. So don't here again, this is 26 mean PG and here it is crossing four meters per second as far as peak is concerned. 3D comes in handy. If you look at this, you find that there is doming, but you're not convinced that are you dealing with stenosis or not? There is an early peeling. So whenever you have an early peaking, you are sure that you are not dealing with a severe outtake stenosis, but you are, uh, th this is just an intuitive no finding. You want to document that. Samir, this is the can you, I'm sorry, Samir, can you enlarge your slide? They're not moving now. Just enlarge them first and then move automatically. Is it there? No, it's not seen. This got uh, disconnected. Apne jo purane software hai, wohi best hai sabiz. Nothing new software is ever done. Now enlarge them up. Wine bottle downstairs. Slideshow. Yes, now I will move. Sure. Go ahead, please. So this is what it is. Then we went into our uh, mode and we wanted to check out something and then we did a transesophageal echo. So here are certain pictures of, see this, if you look at this trans uh, esophageal echo, I'll attempt to freeze it somewhere and show you that there is a doming. It's a very beautiful doming that you see. And if you concentrate here, you will find that See this, this is the doming part of it. This curve is doming. And not only that, it is leaking valve also. Here is a picture which shows that there is a leak, which is, uh, here it looks only nothing more than mild, but all the same, there is an out stenosis. So we wanted to quantify it. Could we, could we not? And then we did, uh, this is, um, explain and in this explain we try to see there is a commercial fusion it is clearly tricommercial valve but there is a commercial fusion here between the right and the left here this is transesophageal so interatrial septum is superiorly placed and then we did some T jugglers and we found that this was indeed a tricuspid uh, well, which was stenosis. So this also, these are all juggleries which can help. Uh, I'm not saying that 3D is mandatory, but if you look at, uh, if you have the T and you have the luxury of uh, experimenting with it, play with it, there is no harm in it. And these are useful things. So look at all the possible views. Uh, shamelessly utilize GLS because good 20% of your outtake stenosis patients will be amyloid. Use 3D calcium scoring, dobutamine stress echo, but do it carefully because it's a dangerous game. And lastly, respect your clinical skills. I'll be very happy to take any questions and please keep shooting across. All right, guys, let's uh, have a question answer session. Please raise your hand. Anything which you'd like to ask, one by one, I'll call up the name and you can ask the question or to call the name. Sure, two participants. Uh, Dr. Nikita Goel and Dr. Rahul Bansode. Dr. Nikita, go ahead. 
Sir, I just want you to repeat the M mode slide of bicuspid aortic valve which you were explaining the regarding the uh, aortic stenosis. So can you just please repeat that slide? Slides are getting shared. Yes. Yeah, it's very, very well, Sunil. Perfect. Yes, sir, this side. So, this is the opening. This is the closure. If you look at this, this is the opening and this is the closure. This closure is absolutely midline. In an eccentric closure, you are worried that whether you are, why are you having this eccentric closure? Because this eccentric closure is a feature which is seen in bicuspid aortic valve. Let me give you, let me just try to find out if there is uh, some more slides that I can pull out for uh, M mode. Hang on. Okay, so this is, are you, are you able to see the slideshow? No. Yes, sir. Which one? I'm not too sure what you are saying. Uh, sir, it's... I'm, I'm showing you a different one. Hang on. Now, can you see it? Yes, sir. These are different closure lines. This is classical. Can you see the number one? Yes, sir. This is closure line. Absolutely central. Now, this closure line has gone superiorly. Why? Because it's a bicuspid aortic valve. This closure line has come downwards in number five because this is a bicuspid aortic valve. So, there are two types of bicuspid aortic valve, the left, right and the uh, superior, inferior. Either which ways, these closure lines will not remain central because this is not how God has made the valve to open or close. Now, there are more issues that what happens in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you look at the number eight one, this is the one which is quite classical that there is a mid-systolic closure. This mid-systolic closure occurs because the moment LV starts to contract, it pushes out blood. The moment it pushes out blood through a narrowed left ventricle outflow tract, there is a high velocity. This high velocity sucks the anterior mitral leaflet and it gets almost stuck to the septum. Sometimes it gets stuck also, which is known as a SAM septal contact. The moment there is a contact, the flow across LVOT reduces or stops. When the flow across LVOT stops, what will happen to systole? The aortic valve will close off. In systole, it will close off. <coughs> At least it will partially close off. The moment it closes off, what happens to the velocity? Velocity becomes zero. Velocity becomes zero. Your Bernoulli's principle goes for a six because it has to be high velocity to create low pressure, to cause suction effect, to cause systolic anterior motion, to cause gradients across LVOT and to cross uh, the aortic uh, valve. The moment this stops, there is a flow reversal. There is a flow. Again, it starts and this is how it is. So these, this, this is something very interesting which is absolutely uh, physics. It's pure physics. Plus, you can see vegetations, you can see some shaggy uh, calcifications, uh, you can see uh, fluttering of aortic valve uh, because of uh, redundancy. Uh, many times, these leaflets are long and high output state it happens. In low cardiac states, the opening is narrowed. Now, I just hope it uh, sorts out your uh, issue, uh, you just wanted yes, to eccentric closure line, which is not yes. safe, but yes, I have sir. shown you some more examples. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Rahul Bansode. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for your nice elaborate lecture, sir. Uh, sir, my question is regarding uh, Bernoulli's equation, sir. 
so you mentioned uh, like uh, uh, where where there there, uh, there will be higher velocities the pressure will be lesser there but uh, our bernal equations mentions like uh, pressure is equal to 4 v square that is pressure uh, is directly proportional to velocities so, uh, uh, the uh, the point you mentioned is contradicting to the equation sir i am mm -hmm. not getting what you are saying sir yeah so i wish i had a board here this is a tube in this tube what is happening is there is a place where there is a constriction when you start putting the jet here whenever there is a maximum velocity here the velocities will be zero but where will they start recovering the moment they come out of it this is pressure recovery phenomenon that at the place where there is a maximum velocity there is a conversion of potential to kinetic energy it has bernoulli's uh, had an idea about velocity but not about energy there is a little bit of a dichotomy yes yes okay thank you sir all right dr jaslin uh, good evening sir so there is one thing i have not understood since we cannot calculate ava in our 2d echo machines when in case we get a uh, good velocity across the a higher velocity gradient across the aortic valve how do we say it is subvalvular or valvular i i couldn't understand Sorry, come again. Her question is, when we get a high velocity across aortic valve, okay. oh, how do you question. say valvular versus subvalvular? Lovely question. So you go into the uh, five chamber, put color. The moment you start seeing aliasing or the moment you start seeing turbulence, aliasing is a term used for uh, pulse uh, wave, but in color, you start seeing uh, turbulence, the moment you start seeing turbulence, that is the place where your gradients are starting. So they could be mid cavity, they could be having LVOT, they could be having aortic valve. So if you are having a velocity which starts to increase or color which starts to become turbulent post valve, you are sure that it is LV, uh, aortic valve uh, stenosis. And how you confirm it? You confirm it by 2D not by anything, not by Dopplers, but by 2D. See the valve, see the uh, structures, see the morphology. And for yes. LVOT, of course, you have your own uh, methods to do it. There used to be a very interesting feature, which is called the high frequency repetitive, uh, HPRF, high pulse repetitive frequency, which is now not uh, uh, available. But what it used to do is it used to give you pulse repetitive frequency at different segments with high uh, velocities. But again, the, the, the physics was that instead of it, it was a hybrid between pulse and uh, continuous wave, but uh, this is something which is there. Yes, sir. and so you said for GLS, what is the full form of GLS? Global longitude and strain. We will talk about it. And yes. this is um, something which is a little uh, more evolved. But uh, yes, we shall discuss this as well. Thank you, uh, sir. Sir, I wanted to ask in this key, uh, you mean to say that when we have a subvalvular aortic stenosis, the turbulence will be seen inside the uh, aortic cavity that we see in the five chamber view? Uh, in the left ventricle outflow tract or left ventricle? Correct. Okay. In the left end. Ventricle. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay. chamber will give you LVOT. Okay. Thank you. I think she is Dr. Padma Padireti. Uh, iPad somebody, I don't, I don't recognize who is with the iPad is. Unmute yourself first. I'll speak loudly. We are not able to hear you. Uh, myself, Dr. Soni Khurana. Soni Khurana. Okay, Dr. Soni. You have to swallow a mic or come closer to your iPad. Your voice is not heard at all. Uh, sir, uh, in uh, COPD patients, 
and uh, we have to do some foster view. So, how to do audit evaluation in sub foster view? Her question is, Samir, like uh, in COBT patients, we only see a subcostal window. So how do we evaluate aortic stenosis in COBT patient through subcostal window? I'm, I'm picking out uh, my slides for subcostal window. I'll show it to you. Actually, uh, subcostal is a very uh, interesting window. Most of the pediatricians will not go anywhere except just keep hunting for the subcostal window and they'll make all the views there. Because in subcostal window, what you can do is you can get across into the subcostal, open up the LV in longitudinal uh, ways. I'm just trying to figure out if I can pick up my slides of subcostal window and show you uh, our dextinosis. I don't have that subcostal window. But uh, once you get used to doing subcostal windows, you will be able to find that it is easy to uh, do it. But uh, again, I'll tell you the biggest challenge is your caveat. The first caveat which you have put is the biggest challenge that this is uh, COPD patient. In COPD patients, you do find that many a times you get a very good uh, subcostal and rest of the windows are very poor. But uh, you can. You have to just manipulate the probe clockwise, anti-clockwise, start looking at the gradients, and you'll find that out a valve. You can see well. But in, in such patients, again, I would say that in case you are challenged in any other way, please do a transesophageal echo, which will give you a better way, or do a MRI. I will give you an answer, Sony. We'll record it and show you like how do we do it next time. We have a lot of time. Samir will find it out and then we'll find yes, it. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Haq, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, why why planimetry is not used for aortic valve area? It is, it, it is, it is, it is. Ahmad Bhai, it is, it is very well used. The only thing is that in transthoracic, yes. short axis in an adult, you may not get very good planimetered area. But in transesophageal, yes, it is very well validated uh, way to measure out a valve area. So, uh, in uh, we should we we should uh, planimeter planimeterize in uh, transesophageal. Transesophageal, transesophageal okay. is the best modality for planimetering the out a valve area. So, sir, I will I tell you the to... limitation. The limitation is just in case it's a poor LV. In poor LV, your Problem is that you want to see what is uh, your truthful area. And because of poor LV, many a times the aortic valve doesn't open up completely. Yes. So you would be overestimating stenosis. Since it is not opening up completely, okay. you will say that it is more severe than what it is. So in such cases, instead of doing a planimeter area, which you can do in transesophageal, but be cautious that better is to do a debutamin so that increase the contractility, increase the jet velocity, increase the gradients and uh, reduce the outer valve area. Okay. Sir, I, I have another question, if, if I may. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sir, uh, why in uh, pulmonary stenosis, we don't use mean pressure gradient to ca categorize the severity? So you can use mean. It is not that you can't use mean, you can use mean, but actually it has not been validated. The problem is validation. It is not that you can't use aortic valve, pulmonary valve area is not quantified in, as, as a, a, a centimeter square. Because again, because uh, right side of the heart has always been a very ignored kind of uh, section. And most of the pulmonary stenosis patients, they have a very good survival. So uh, all they have to do is just go by whatever are the conventional criteria and don't change too much of it. 
Okay, These days, people have started talking a lot. They started talking about the pulmonary uh, artery size um, for men and women. It is differential 27 for men and 25 for women, 29 and 25 for women. They have started talking about the ratio that the outtake area and pulmonary, pulmonary to outtake area, if it is um, uh, uh, less than 0 0.9 uh, those those are all several things which people have started talking about but for all practical purposes whether the kid has to go for pulmonary uh, balloon pulmonary valve valvotomy or no then gradients are the best systolic gradients peak gradients are the best okay sir so another question please mm -hmm. sir lvot vti and uh, aortic valve vti ratio the dimensional index, uh, dimensionless index in Correct. measuring the aortic, uh, aortic stenosis severity. How, uh, how good is it? It's very good, provided uh, you, it's more validated for actually uh, uh, prosthetic heart valve, less validated, but equally good, but uh, it's a ratio. The problem mm -hmm. with ratio has its own limitation absolute values also have their own limitation but if you go by the ratio you you put with that it uh, keeps changing because of the uh, size many a times in post stenotic dilatation the dbis cannot be trusted too too much for both pulmonary or outtake there are some validation studies for pulmonary stenosis also sir i mean when we should use this this uh, uh, this criteria for the always, the always. always. but okay. if you if you look at the recommendations and guidelines they don't propose that you base your interventions on dvi for that mean pg rotate valve area and need of uh, ALS, calcium so that's what sort of is not yet in the D. It is used for diagnosis of severity of our stenosis. Completely agree with that. But unfortunately, it is not being used for making a decision for intervention. Research. Dr. Mohammed Daud. Sir, I have got a confusion uh, regarding the continuity equation uh, around the aortic valve area. I have a question. If uh, the uh, subvalvular area uh, in the LVOT is uh, constricted, then how to? Uh, I, I want to understand that thing that sir told me, told us. Like so you are saying that there is a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or you yes, are sir. having a subaortic uh, stenosis. Yes, sir. So how how are you going to? So it is based on a premise that whatever comes in has to go out. Yes, so whatever is your LVOT diameter and whatever is the LVOT velocity, your velocity will also increase. Yes, sir. So the ratio will remain the same or roughly will get negated maximally. So those ratios will continue to begin because your input has to match the output. Yes, sir. If your input has got narrower opening, it will have higher velocity. And similarly, if your output has to be the same, then whatever it is, your outtake valve area has to change adjusting to the velocity. This is philosophical explanation. So then how to say that it is aortic stenosis when it is subvalvular? Valve is okay. It, it does not say that. It says A1, V1. If yes, your sir. LBOT area and velocity time integral of LVOT is yes. X. Yes. And it has to be equal to A2, V2, which is yes, optic valve area multiplied by the velocity time index. So ratios have an advantage that they can equate or cancel each other's stenosis or velocities. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ajoy. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Ajay. Uh, thank you, sir. 
Sir, my question is uh, in aortic stenosis, um, highest velocity is recorded usually in which view? Usually by Tim, if that is the question. Sir? But not necessarily so. Okay, sir. And sir, my second question is, which is the best view to uh, sampling LVOT flow? Best view? Again, yes, sir. but avoid the PISA. Avoid the uh, flow ex uh, acceleration just prior to the valve. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Daud. Dr. Daud, Dr. are you there? All right, Dr. Gyasudin. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So my question is, what are the definite indicators when we can comment it is aortic stenosis or aortic sclerosis? Differentiating features. Differentiating features. Stenosis versus sclerosis. So there is only one criteria which is mentioned, but it has its own caveats. The deficiency of this uh, 2.5 meters per second is the cutoff. Anything lesser than that, you label it as a sclerosis. Anything more than that, you label it as a uh, stenosis. Uh, the only problem is that in low flow, low gradient, poor LV situations, this velocities could be also significant stenosis and not necessarily sclerosis. So this is all validated only for normal LV. I would, I would, I would be happy to uh, see the morphology. If it is a bicuspid aortic valve with velocity of 2.5, I would still want to keep the patient in more of surveillance and just say that this is sclerosis, so just get off. Sclerosis majority of time would be an elderly age population right. because you have to look at like in total, don't look at one particular thing. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Dr. Gyasuddin, are you done? Yes, all right. Yes, Dr. Rokan has asked one question Pulse wave, how do you use pulse wave in subvalvular, valvular, and supravalvular uh, stenosis? How do you use pulse wave, doctor? So <laughs> Partly, I did answer that question. Yes, you have when to you, repeat it again. When, when, when you uh, get into a confusion that where are the gradients coming from, you put in a color Doppler. What is color Doppler? Color Doppler is many, many, many pixels of pulse. Pulse wave at many places, color coded is called color Doppler. So actually, color Doppler is a form of rusty of pulse wave. And this is how you do it. And exactly the way you want to quantify is where is the maximum gradient? Say if you have to do a uh, septal ablation of the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you have to know your level of obstruction. And that is the time best is to keep inching pulse wave and just start seeing wherever the acceleration occur is occurring the maximum. You will not be able to quantify it, but from suddenly from normal to abnormal, the moment it comes, you are sure that this is the place where it is. So conversion of normal to abnormal is the place where pulse velocity will set the level. But it is not necessary that the maximum will be there. Maximum may be more distance, but at least Lesser than that, it is normal. So there is there is a way to use your pulse Doppler, and this pulse Doppler is a very useful phenomenon. I wish there was a way that they could increase how to take maximum velocities with a pulse Doppler. There is no way to do it at this point of time, though. And then you have to be very dependent upon your 2D. Go into parasol long axis and see where is the maximum place where there is a uh, contractility, uh, the, the septum is contracting. You'll be able to see the SAM, you'll be able to see the cordal SAM. Many a times the cordy starts getting a SAM. So you are sure that this is the place where there is a 
gradient which starts if not the maximum next question is samir if you have as and ar how do you calculate how do you say the severity of uh, Aortic, is it continuity equation or something else? Continuity equation comes as the best because in aortic regurgitation, all the velocities are exaggerated. All of them are exaggerated. And if your continuity equation fails you, then best is to go and do a transesophageal echo and take a planimetered area in still systole. All right. Dr. Muhammad Mamun Islam. Dr. Muhammad Mahmoud Islam, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's a very beautiful lecture. I have a uh, just a uh, question that is, in, I need some clarification of Doppler ages in aortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I just missed, the, missed that part. Please, sir. Sorry, come again. Sir, Doppler ages. That is in HOCM or in AS. What about the uh, dense edges or rack part? Edges. Yes, sir. Doppler edges, sir. During Doppler, in aortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, what is the difference? Samir is asking for Doppler flow patterns in AS, aortic yes, stenosis, or other like uh, what is the like, slower acceleration time, long acceleration time? Inverted key slope shape. Yes, sir. Uh, allow me to share my slides. Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, Doctor Islam, this is uh, what is Doppler flow patterns basically. It's not edges. It's a Doppler yes. flow pattern based on acceleration, deceleration time. That's what we are looking for, right? Yes, sir. Just a minute, give me a minute and I'll come back to you. Open so many windows that Okay, so are you, can you see my slides? Yes, we are romancing now. Okay, so that means you are, I'm there. Not going into the details of uh, things, but uh, I will go and show you some pictures to understand whether we all understand uh, Doppler flows, where is it that we commit errors? So here is a an echo report from a person. So uh, slides not moving. Yes. Go ahead, please. So this is a story about somebody who came. This is the echo. Can you see the pictures? Anything which you can find out in 2D? Nothing great. So we went on to do a Doppler. Any idea what we are dealing with? Uh, Dr. Islam, you asked that question. Who asked that question? The doctor uh, Mamul. Dr. Muhammad Mahmoud Islam. Dr. Islam, are you there? So let me just show you this picture that what is this flow? I would be happy anybody in the house can pick it up, what it is. 2D 
doctor was absolutely normal. If somebody wants to educate us, what is this flow? Anybody? We have had a class on Dopplers. So, since nobody is volunteering, let me just tell you the confusion. This is in systole. And this is the Doppler which is right across and it is in systole. So, where is the flow coming from? The flow is going from below upwards. It's a northward flow. So, something is pushing from LA right till the apex. What it could be? Mitral valve, but mitral valve has a flow only in diastole. It doesn't have a flow in systole. So, where is it coming from? From hypertrophic ventricle, again, in systole, if at all the blood has to go, it will go from above downwards towards aorta. So, where is this flow coming from? And then we started tracing it because when you put Doppler across mitral valve, this doesn't move well. But when you put a Doppler across uh, color Doppler, you find that there is a torrential flow from uh, one of the pulmonary veins, which is red upwards. So this is a pulmonary venous flow. So once having understood this, let me just come back to some of the velocity patterns which was being asked. So this is, <clears throat> again, severe out stenosis. Oh, this is another, this I won't touch at this point of time, but at some point of time, we need to talk about this. What is this flow? Anybody, I, any idea? <clears throat> Two Doppler patterns alternating. One large, one short, one large. The one short. Alterance. Sorry? Pulses alternance. Lovely. This is not only pulses alternance, this is electrical alternance. Electric. But pulses alternance, electrical alternance, and this is Doppler alternance. So this is a very poor uh, doctor, uh, uh, poor LV. Okay. Uh, Let me just try to find out the answers to the question which he was asked. This is stuck well at some point of time when we are talking about prosthetic parts. We'll talk about it. This is fluoroscopy of the same single leaflet moving. But I'm just trying to I think it was in this presentation. Okay. So here is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you were asking about. Classical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you look at this, where are the gradients expected to start from? In this, it is expected to, if you look at this, look at the mitral, it gets sucked in. Look at the cordy, it gets sucked in. Look at the left ventricle, it starts getting sucked in from mid cavity onwards. I'll keep playing this till such time everybody is convinced. So if you look at this, uh, here is the mitral which is getting tilted. Here is the two uh, septum and the uh, lateral wall which are almost kissing each other. And this is what. Now let's see what the traces were. So again, the gradients are started right from the center here onwards. And when you look at, uh, look at this, this is more dramatic. This is mid cavity gradient. When I said that you have to cross check it by 2D, this is what I meant. That don't trust entirely your Doppler signals because Doppler signals in pulse can just tell you that flow acceleration is happening from here onwards. But till where, you don't know because that gets all merged and continuous velocities will pick up the only the uh, detailed ones later. So here is the aortic valve closure, which is uh, mid cavity because SAM is happening. And here is what the pattern was. Now, this is the pattern, which is quite classical for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Initial peak, SAM. The moment SAM comes, the velocities drop. The, when the velocities drop, the pressure reduces. When the pressure reduces, the valve opens again. And when the valve opens again, there is a mid-systolic again. So this is 
a translation of your clinical findings also in hypertrophic obstructive fight cardiomyopathy what is uh, uh, described in the apex is a double apical impulse or a triple apical impulse so this is a typical typical double apical impulse triple apical impulse also is seen many a times when the atria kicks but that is in diastole this is not in systole so but you can feel the pulse that is in cadence kind of uh, this thing which is like a uh, horse running uh, this is a mid systolic notch which happens selectively only in systole okay so this okay so i have it here somewhere right parasital somebody was asking about uh, no okay i don't have that view of the 2d so what else was there doppler patterns these are we have already discussed it some bit okay so we can have a separate session on only a different kind of doppler patterns and how to interpret doppler patterns but suffice it for the day that this is what the patterns of subaortic uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy you will have edges which will show a plus lobster claw appearance the, the one which i showed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was a lobster claw appearance okay so my next question is from dr saifuddin azad saifuddin are you there so oh, thank you sir Uh, sir, my question to sir uh, during assessing uh, aortic stenosis severity, if patient have at that time any uh, ventricular arrhythmia or atrial arrhythmia, so is there is a, any impact on arrhythmia during assessing aortic stenosis? Absolutely, there is no uh, confusion that with arrhythmias you will be able you will commit errors. so it is entirely long diastole will give you high gradients short diastole will give you short gradients worst is atrial fibrillation it is always better to average and best is to have more objective evidence by doing a planimetry uh, using transies or wait for a normal sinus agent thank you sir the dr rubayat uh, good evening sir Uh, so sometimes in moderate uh, or severe aortic regurgitation we get increased uh, peak velocity across the aortic valve although today showing apparently normal valve morphology how will we categorize uh, uh, aortic stenosis in that case sir so uh, if you really want to objectively see you calculate aortic valve area and planimetry across if you are getting a very good uh, short axis in transthoracic you can use it but better is to use a transesophageal but our uh, area is more predictive sir uh, if uh, we get the peak velocity around uh, uh, 4 meter second or 3 more than 3 meter per second uh, then uh, only the planimetry will solve the uh, problem sir aortic valve area ava by continuity equation okay thank you sir sir uh, my another question sir uh, in uh, sometimes we get uh, increased velocity across the pulmonary valve and uh, we uh, know that uh, the peak velocity across the normal pulmonary valve is around 1 uh, meter per second but uh, we uh, get around 1.8 or 2 in that case uh, is it normal so if your valve doesn't show calcification if your valve doesn't show thickening if your valve is opening well then it could only be a normal finding because every normal has a range and cutting across so thin is unfair but in case you find that the velocities are high and still your valve is opening well without any evidence of stenosis hunt for asd hunt for an intracardiac shunt hunt for anemia hunt for very very hunt for uh, av fistulas hunt for pregnancy because if you look at physiologically the largest known av fistula is placenta and whenever there is a high uh, flow situation uh, velocities across any valve will increase across pulmonary valve too thank you sir 
there's a question from Dr. Vikas Agarwal. Can you elaborate a little bit on post-stenotic dilatation? So post-stenotic dilatation across aortic valve is a feature which is seen with bicuspid aortic valve and that's the reason why people have started labeling bicuspid aortic valve as a disease of aorta. Cutoffs. If there is a post-stenotic dilatation, does it need attention? Certainly. If it is bicuspid aortic valve, aggressive people, the moment it is greater than five will start doing a mental surgery. That means replace the valve, have a composite graft, transplant the coronary arteries and that's it. Now, this worsens in case this bicuspid aortic valve is associated with Marfan's. Cutoff is 4.5. But for a non-Marfan's, non-bicuspid, you can wait safely till 5.5. This is the relevance of ascending aorta dilatation and post-stenotic dilatation is this. Now comes to pulmonary valve. Pulmonary stenosis also has a post-stenotic dilatation, but unfortunately it has got nothing to do with uh, uh, severity or prognosis. This is something very beautiful about pulmonary stenosis. However, if there is a pulmonary artery dilatation, regardless of pulmonary stenosis or no pulmonary stenosis more than six, this needs attention. Then one more question is, what information we should give to surgeon that this valve requires surgery? He has asked everything in one sentence. He has asked me a very loaded question. Why should the surgeon ask you for Tavi? <laughs> the interventional cardiologist will never ask for surgery and surgery will never ask for Tavi. This is something very interesting. Now, uh, whatever are the indications for surgery these days are the indications for TAVI. The only thing where TAVI succeeds over surgery is if you have a porcelain aorta. If your aorta is thick calcific, like porcelain, you don't have enough space for going on a bypass. So it's difficult to put cannula and this becomes a clear-cut indication for TAVI. Now, low-risk group, surgery is always preferred. For moderate and high-risk, TAVI and open surgery. For high-risk, certainly TAVI is better. For moderate, they are non-inferior. For low-risk, open surgery is something which is still preferred because we don't have enough data. Uh, there are certain contraindications to TAVI and these contraindications are, one is that in case it is a predominant aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation valves don't hold. This is one contraindication. Second contraindication is in case there is an ascending aorta which is dilated because if there is an ascending aorta which is dilated, which is aneurysmal, then certainly this is going to worsen over a period of time. And this is the time when you need a surgery, surgeon where valve with ascending aorta um, management should be there. And most of the times they'll do a mental surgery. As far as calcium is concerned, as far as the severity of uh, aortic stenosis is concerned, poor LVs is concerned, they all humbug. Anything can be done anytime. Anybody else some questions before we close down this session? So I think Samit, we have to pay thanks to the audience for the thank you all listening. for attending and being very patient listeners. listeners. And thank you very much, everybody. I hope we had a good session on aortic stenosis and uh, hopefully your doubts would have been cleared by now. Try these methods if you have an assist to echo machine. All these things which you can practice and it's a very simple way of learning echocardiography is just look at LVOT diameter, LVOT VTI and aortic valve VTI. I think that will give you a lot of answers for aortic stenosis. With this, let me say goodbye. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, everybody. And see you next week at the same time, 8 o'clock. 
for the next session on regurgitations. Good night, Shabakar. Bye-bye.